we've got a copy of this. Um, and so, yes, just really want to say welcome, um, everyone, to this, our second session in our volunteer festival, um, Marking Volunteers Week this year. So welcome all. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, so for the next sort of 40, 45 minutes or so, um, I'm delighted to welcome Tracy Mitchell, who's the Managing Director of JTS, Just Trading Scotland, um, along with a special guest um, who Tracy will introduce us to um, in a moment. So welcome everyone, enjoy. There will be some time for questions after the presentation. So do sort of store those up and then we'll invite you to ask those once um, Tracy has finished. So I'll hand over to you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for, for joining this afternoon. Um, it's really good to be part of this, this festival and to, 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 to meet you all, on, if online. Um, JTS is a small social enterprise. We import and sell good quality food produce from smallholder farmers and producers in some of the poorest parts of the world. We're owned by a parent charity, the Balmore Trust, who plow back any profit that we might make into capacity building and support for our partners in the Global South. I've titled my talk today, JTS, to true origin, a journey involving rice and pasta sauce and so much more. I'll talk a little bit about the background to JTS and what we do, and then I'll move on to our plans for the future. So JTS grew out of the work of two fair trade shops in the Glasgow area, the Balmore Coach House, which is in Balmore, and Rainbow Turtle in Paisley. The Coach House at Balmore had been set up in the late 1980s by Professor John Riches of Glasgow University and his wife, Nana, a doctor. That followed a year where they'd spent time in the Transkei during the apartheid era in South Africa. Um, and the shop was their response to the awful poverty they witnessed whilst away. It was very successful. So much so that when the Scottish government was keen for businesses in Scotland to work with producers in Malawi, John was asked to visit Malawi in autumn 20. 2008. And there he met with NASFAM, the National Association of Smallholder Farmers of Malawi, and particularly with some groups of smallholder farmers, smallholder rice farmers that, that NASFAM worked with. They were looking for ways of increasing their sales through export and thereby bringing foreign exchange into the country. John agreed, rather rashly if you think about it, to buy a container of rice, that's 18 tonnes of rice, and to set up JTS to import and sell it. John's thinking was inspired partly by a lady from Bangladesh. She had set up an enterprise to make saris and to provide work for women who would otherwise be destitute on city streets. Inspired by her work, John had offered her a grant from the profits at the coach house. She refused it. She asked John to stock the saris and sell them, saying they deserved dignity, not charity. He never forgot that, and around our 10th anniversary in 2019, we adopted the strapline Dignity Through Trade, which sums up exactly what we are about. Kilimbero rice is grown by smallholder farmers who have perhaps an acre or so to cultivate. They belong to an association called CASFA, which enables us to deal with some 5,000 farming families. Kilimbero rice was named as the most ethical rice you can buy in the UK in a survey carried out by the Ethical Consumer magazine in 2019. What slightly let us down at that point was our non-recyclable packaging. And I'm pleased to say that in the last week, we have launched newly rebranded rice, which is recyclable. The bag is now recyclable. My own journey in JTS began in January 2009 as the organisation was getting going. My early role was to try and find a way of selling that 18 tonnes of rice that John had agreed to import. Something that my husband was particularly keen I was successful at. I've been running a fair trade stall at my church for a number of years and he was very used to eating up out of date items from the stall, but he reckoned 18 tonnes of rice was somewhat beyond him. Hence the 90 kilo challenge. In a conversation in Malawi, one of the farmers had told John that selling 90 kilos of rice would impact his life and, and how it would do that in terms of providing a sustainable income. As an example, in a country where less than one in three children 
are able to attend secondary school. Selling that much rice on fair trade terms would enable him to send the child to secondary school for a year. Bring fair trade to life. We encourage children, schools, churches, fair trade groups and others to buy 90 kilos of rice from us and sell this on. It's a great way to encourage, to engage participants, to, to educate them and to inspire them on the good that fair trade does in our world. They can see directly the impact of their buying decisions and how they're helping to provide a better life for some of those in the poorest communities in Malawi. It's a very visual activity and it has been endorsed by the Fair Trade Foundation as counting towards fair trade school and fair trade town status. I have got a wee video there, but I think because I want to give enough time for our special guest, I'm going to skip that. Um, so 14 years on from that initial container of rice, we have grown. We now sell around £400,000 worth of goods a year. And we currently import from six producer groups in South Africa, the Kingdom of Eswatini, <coughs> excuse me, Kenya, Malawi and Sri Lanka. We aim to create long term relationships with our producer partners. In the Kingdom of Eswatini, we work with Eswatini Kitchen. Life is not easy in Eswatini, a country with an absolute monarchy and a highly controlled political system. There is a lack of employment, always food and medicine shortages, and particularly a lack of opportunities for rural women. Initially set up by Mancini Youth Care, who work mainly with orphans in Eswatini, Eswatini Kitchen is now owned by Sonia and Carlos Paver. The factory processes fruit and vegetables grown locally, mostly by women farmers. The products have been imported to the UK for many years, initially by Oxfam and then by the Balmoral Trust and now by JTS. We import jams, marmalades, spicy sauces and chutneys from Eswatini Kitchen. Sonia, their leader, also leads a variety of initiative projects on the back of Eswatini Kitchen through the Women Farmer Foundation. Another producer partner we work with is Mars Kitchen in Sri Lanka. This organisation was set up by Mario de Alvis in response to the civil war in his country. Before the war, his family owned a guest house, but tourism dried up and he saw people in poverty all around him. So he set up a factory to process coconuts into coconut milk. Mars Coconut Milk is organic and fair trade certified from a small producer who cares for his people and is immensely proud of the heritage of his country. Our beer bread comes from Barrett's Ridge in South Africa. This business was set up by Tyrene, a woman who loves beer, bread and South Africa, probably in that order. She uses her grandmother's family recipe. The bag sewing is done by local women and the packing is done by the Akuma Community Foundation, which was started to improve and brighten the lives of township women. They supply and equip informal creches to run feeding schemes for over 200 children each day in the Western Cape. Tyrene is passionate about what she does and the need to provide work in this area to pull people out of desperate poverty. We've partnered with Turkle Trading in South Africa for 10 years now, bringing some wonderful gift packs, particularly for Oxfam, as well as a range of hot sauces and spices. Peter and Rain are the founders of Turkle Trading. Their aim was to build a food trading company with a conscience they're passionate about empowering disadvantaged communities by supporting education, raising awareness of gender-based violence and developing their workforce. I'm not going to tell you about Meru Herbs, the vulnerable producer group that I was going to tell you about because I'm absolutely thrilled that this week we have Sally, who's the managing director of Meru Herbs with us in Scotland. And rather than me tell you about the work they do, I'm gonna hand over now to Sally and let her talk for the next few minutes about the work they do. Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm really humbled to be here today. My name is Sally and I am from here. Meru Hubs is a community-based social enterprise we grow and we process organic herbal teas, tropical food jams, and tomato-based sauces. 90% of what we produce is exported to fair trade organizations. 
our primary mission as Meru Hubs is to improve the quality of life of our producers, their families, and also to empower the women in our community. Meru Hubs is located in a semi-arid region in Kenya, and the community is really marginalized. And there was a burning need to create a source of income, especially for the, for the women in the community. And so in 1991, Meru Hubs was started. We started with a small group of farmers, of producers, about 33 of them, who would grow uh, hibiscus, chamomile, and lemongrass, and then we'd bring it to the processing unit of Meru Hubs, which is, which is located in the middle of the, of the community. And immediately this uh, project began, we were able to employ between 20 to 50 women they come, they, pre they prepare the herbs. The lady in the slide, her name is Grace. She's, she's in a hibiscus farm. And so the women prepare the herbs by shelling, they cut, they, they dry their herbs. And when we started, we did not have any machinery. So we used to sell in bulk. But in a few years, we were able to invest in machinery and then we were able to, to add value. And so we started sending sending finished products to our fair trade partners. And then in 1995, uh, we realized the same farmers that were growing the herbs also had a lot of fruits that were going to waste. And at that time, it was in December when we had a really huge produce of mango. And the farmers were like, what do we do with the mangoes? The fruits are just going to waste. What can we do? How can we add value? How can we reduce the post-wastage? Um, losses and post harvest uh, losses. So we got an expert to come and show us how to make jam. And step by step, they showed us how to cook the jam to the right to the right pH, the right bricks, and then we how to preserve it because it doesn't have any additives or colorants, natural. And we were very keen. Quality has always been key for us at Meru Hubs. We're very keen that we are producing a product that can compete internationally, that can sit squarely on the shelves and is of top quality. And then um, one of the things that we, we have at the heart of Meru Hubs is the women. This is because of the opportunities that fair trade system, the opportunities that Meru Hubs has had has created for the women. They are able to earn their own money that they can actually budget, make decisions on them on, on the income that they're getting. They are able to have leadership positions in Meru Hubs. 90% of the staff in Meru are actually women. They take up leadership positions. So they're not just another face in Meru Hubs. They are seen, they are heard, and they are able to participate also in decision making. I could give you an example of one of the ladies called Angelica. Angelica joined Meru Hubs straight from high school. She didn't get the opportunity to go to, to, for a, to a higher learning institution. And so she had an opportunity to work at Meru Hubs. And she was among the pioneers of the, Mer, of the Meru Hubs Jam Factory, which she heads at the moment. And um, she has been able to, uh, to educate her children through to university. She's been able to improve the food security of her family. She's been able to build a better home for her family. And one of the things that is so difficult to come across in rural Kenya is women owning their own piece of land, having titles that actually have their own names, not the names of their husbands or their parents. And that is one of the things that a lot of women in Meru Hubs have been able to, to achieve. By just by being part of the Meru Hubs uh, family. The lady in the, the slide, her name is Grace. She grows hibiscus and, and chamomile. And she's also one of the ladies that has really improved the standard of living of her family just by, by producing the, the herbs and also fruits that are used in making the jams and the tomatoes that are used to make the sauces. Another thing about Meru Hubs is we are also very conscious about climate change. It's really affected us because we've really had erratic seasons where farmers would grow their crop and one point at one point we lost the whole crop because there was too much water. Then the next time we, we lost the crop because it was too dry. So it's really become unpredictable compared to the previous time when we were sure that you're putting a crop 
it's going to rain and you're it's going to have you're going to have enough rain that is going to uh, lead to a bumper harvest now we're not sure anymore so every time we we plant but then we pray and hope that everything goes well um but in our own way as marrow hubs we try to mitigate to mitigate that by powering our entire factory on solar and we go further and uh, and try and encourage the farmer the staff and the producers also to use solar energy in their homes. So we have these projects with JPS in Gavit's Mill where we where we have solar lamps for the producers and they can use them at home. When the children come in the evening, they can use the solar lamps to, to like read and, and uh, do their homeworks. And it's clean, renewable energy. In any case, Kenya has a lot of a lot of hot sun that we can use to to produce, I mean, clean, renewable energy. And again, electricity is also very expensive back at home in Kenya. Uh, in terms of the future, we're looking into producing uh, new new products. We're working at the moment with JTS through Origin to create new products that you will be seeing in your in your shelves. And as a parting shot, every single jar, every single packet, every every single purchase means a lot to Greece, means a lot to Angelica. It goes directly to the producers. Every little support that is given to our producers is very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sally. And I really hope that you enjoyed hearing directly from one of the producers that, that we work with. Um, the sorts of products that we primarily um, import from, from Sally are the jams. And then I think hopefully you can see that I'm holding up a tomato and chili sauce and a tomato and basil sauce. Um, these are available through a lot of fair trade shops, but also on, on our own online shop. And if you were inspired by by listening to Sally and felt that you'd like to support her, those those and the jams are available in stock. And as she said, we are working on um, new products. Um, I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about our role in, in WFTO and then um, some of our plans for the future. So in 2020, we achieved World Fair Trade Organization guaranteed status. That means that our processes, the way we run our business is all, and the way our producers run their businesses abide by the 10 principles of, of fair trade. More recently, the CASFA, the Farmers Association in Malawi, also achieved WFTO guaranteed status. And we've been working with Meru Herbs. And we really hope that soon we will hear that they've been granted guarantee status as well. They've been working really hard. They were audited back in February. And there's just the last couple of things to, to sort out before um, that, that status hopefully is, is noted for them. And that is project work that's undertaken in conjunction with our, par our ch parent charity, the Balmore Trust. At JTS, I lead um, a team of, of five employees. Actually, as of this morning, six employees, um, including me. I'm delighted that the team last year um, was shortlisted for the UK Social Enterprise Team of the Year. Um, we are proud of the employment opportunities, qualifications and experience that we've been able to give people in the last 14 years in Paisley. Some of our staff have particularly inspiring stories to tell, and I'd like to quote part of one that was written by our operations manager. And I will warn you that I find this quite emotional when I'm reading this, so um, if I start stuttering a little bit, I apologise. The 8th of February 2010 is the day my life changed for the better. Already a father of two, and with a third on the way, securing employment was at the forefront of my mind. The job centre informed me of a back to work scheme that I was eligible for and I re and recommended that I should apply for a position at JTS. The application form left me with some issues as I had no previous employment history, no education and no referees. I applied with a near empty application form which I expected to get no reply from. To my surprise I was invited for an interview and then bagged myself a job. This journey started for me with the chance to gain employment to support my family. It has turned into a long-term journey I never expected, all because JTS gave me an opportunity. 
from a picker and packer, Martin's original role was packing boxes to leave our warehouse. I now oversee all warehouse duties and work directly with our suppliers, building our supply chains and keeping the warehouse stocked with many fine products that we sell. I've met farmers from Malawi, the Kingdom of Eswatinia, Eswatini, India and Kenya, seeing firsthand the positive effects our work has in these communities and how much our relationship is valued. The JTS you know is one that supports smallholder farmers giving employment, empowerment and a fair price for their goods. The JTS I know is one that gives amazing chances to job seekers, offering them employment, empowerment and a fair wage for their work in the UK. We really try to run our business as a fair trade business right across what we do. Obviously, that's important as far as the 10 principles and how we deal with our producers. But we feel it's important for how we run the UK part of our business as well. And hopefully that quote, which I've edited, uh, edited in terms of made it a much shorter than what's the original blog. But it's it's it is the story of several of our of our staff. Our UK impacts go beyond staff employment, though, and beyond the education work that we do with our 90 kilo challenge. And we and, and they do include supporting a lot of local food banks and food poverty charities with donations of food to support their work. So now on to our new brand and why we're rebranding. This slide gives some of the reasons. I think a crucial one is the lack of awareness of JTS. My guess is that quite a few of you hadn't heard of, of JTS before today. And for those of you that had, maybe there was a confusion as to who we are. Are we a legal company, accountancy company? What does it stand for? Do you just trade in Scotland? All those sorts of questions have come up. Um, most importantly, we want to ensure that we can continue to support our producers. We need to be a stable and sustainable organization. And to do that, we need to grow our sales. We need to attract more customers. Even within the fair trade sector, we're not that well known, but certainly beyond the fair trade sector, we're not known. And there's currently no visual consistency between our product range. So True Origin is the new brand name that we will, we're delighted to start using across the JTS range with the first product launched last week. The new brand reflects our goal to have true impact at Origin. Stressing the fact that we work directly with smallholder farmers and producers in the Global South to source the most the, the finest ethical products. Our desire is to make the world fairer for our producers by offering them a sustainable income through our purchases and where appropriate to supplement this with development projects through our charity. Smallholder farmers and producers are at the heart of True Origin. It's in our new name. We are true to the product's origin by providing sustainable incomes which enable the farmers and producers to invest in equipment, education, infrastructure, and environmental protection. Connection is an important part of our identity. And this strong connection with the producers and the consumers has been built into our new brand. I hope I'm now going to show you a short video if it launches okay. So let's just cross our fingers. Um, Somebody wave if it's not working for you. Sometimes this hasn't worked in terms of sound. I could hear something momentarily, Tracy, but we don't seem to be able to see or hear it just now. Sorry? I could hear something momentarily, but we don't seem to be able to hear or see it currently. Right. OK, let's let's skip it then. Um, it's really just explaining some of what I have had just explained. So let me see if I can get back to the slide thing. Um, I've got lots of. Um, let's move on. It's probably easier. Um, so. We are an ethical organisation. We are not going to be throwing things out. So there will be a phased introduction of our new packaging we won't be discarding products that are in the old packaging and also with lots of our producer groups we import once a year so we will have stock for some time for of the old style 
So the rice is the new season rice from, from last year's harvest. It has now launched in the bags that you can see there on, on the, the left of the products there. And then as we introduce the rest of the lines, as we, as we run out, there will be a mix and match for the next wee while. We hope that by the end of 2023, the majority of our products will be in the True Origin branding, that you'll see a connection between them. Um, the Balmore Trust is our parent charity. I'm really pleased that we're increasing our collaboration with the parent charity and that the Trust is joining us on this rebranding to help us tie more closely together in people's minds. After 40 years as the Barmore Trust, they are also changing their name and will become True Origin Partnerships. And they will be focusing on supporting our producer partners through projects, discussions, and ideas such as the Briquette Project, which is just coming to fruition. Some of you may have heard of Grace's Briquette Project. It's about avoiding deforestation in Malawi by using the waste rice husks to create fuel briquettes. And it was all inspired by a female rice farmer called Grace, so we call it Grace's Briquette Project. Um, last autumn, we introduced a small, what we're terming, and friends range on our online shop. This allows us to offer a greater basket of goods to our customers, and crucially also enables us to strengthen our collaboration with other fair trade businesses. This slide is a couple of weeks out of date, and since it was produced, um, we now have Cafe Direct on our online shop as well. As you know, times are tough in the fair trade world. Since Tradecraft ceased trading, we have expanded our range of Friends products in direct response to people asking, and that is very true with Cafe Direct, that we've had a lot of phone calls for pe from people wanting to source coffee, but specifically Cafe Direct coffee. We're pleased to see some encouraging sales as a result. We're keen to build both the sales of our own products and those where um, we are working with other fair trade businesses. We have um, been running over the last little while a crowdfunder. I'm really pleased that as of last night, we have reached the initial target for that. We now have three days left just to see if we can build beyond that. The focus is there is on growing our producer range, the ranges that we bring in from our producers and trying to grow the sales for those. And I think probably that's the end of what the sort of the main bit that I wanted to talk about. And really, I wanted to give some time for questions. I'm guessing that you might well have questions for Sally as well. So I'll maybe get her to come and sit next to me. Um, you want to just pull your chair up, Sally? And yeah, happy to answer try and answer whatever questions you have. Maybe sensible to stop stop sharing screens so that we can actually see people better. That's great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tracy and Sally. What a fantastic presentation. Thank you both. Um, fantastic to hear more about the, the JTS to True Origin journey um, and indeed also more about Meru Herb, Sally, as well. Thank you for, for sharing um, both. Um, both your your presentations. Um, just before I hand over to invite questions from our from our audience, um, I just wanted to say that if you would like to share with us any of the video links that you weren't able to show during that presentation, do drop them through to me in an email, and we'll make sure to circulate those afterwards so that people can watch them, um, in in their own times afterwards. So thank you for for those. Um, and yes, over over to you all. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free just to unmute yourselves um, and ask away. Um, maybe hopefully if your question is for Tracy or Sally, maybe um, address that accordingly. Um, but yeah, over to you all, really. Thank you. Susan, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Really helpful um, to understand um, both the overall picture, but Sally, that was really inspiring to hear re the the sort of pr proper story behind what we see. Um, and now it makes me interested to see the range myself. It's not one that I've tried up till now, so that's great. Um, I suppose mainly a a, a query for Tracy because it must be quite difficult to actually start financing a big expansion and increasing ranges and I just wondered how that's working for you. Um, it's really hard you're absolutely mm -hmm. right particularly because we do operate on fair trade terms so as well as 
needing to pay for the investment in, in new products and so on, we do pay 50% up front when we place orders. And as an example, just to give you a feel for how hard that is, um, the rice that has just started going out of our um, warehouse in the last couple of weeks, we paid the 50%, the first 50% for that last July. Um, and then the balance in December and January, then we had to pay significant sums for the UK processors because the rice doesn't come in from Malawi in a, a way that would meet from UK food standards. Um, it needs to go through cleaning and, and so on in, in the UK to make sure that it's definitely up to UK food standards. And then we have to get it bagged. Um, so there's lots and lots of money has gone out in the last 11 months before we were then able to start selling it. And then most people are on 30 day terms. So we won't start seeing the significant income from that, the first sales of rice until later this month. So almost 12 months after we we paid out tens of thousands in, in prepayment. So it's really hard. Um, how we do it is a mixture of, we have a small number of individuals that have lent us money um, as just as individuals um we we also have a facility with an organization called social investment scotland they have provided in the past purchase order related facilities so very linked to where we have an order from somebody like oxfam or lakeland where both of whom we do supply with christmas gifts um they've provided us with pre-finance um for for that um we have just this march replaced that facility with what they're what it's a fund called the recovery and resilience fund linked to um i guess recovery from covid mm -hmm. and that's given us um a longer term bit of finance and then there's a lot of juggling that i do yes. on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we're paying people at the at the right time that we're chasing debt hard um making sure that we're not owed money by people so that we're, we're getting in money as, as quickly as we can from people that owe us. But it is, I'm afraid to say, a serious piece of work on our behalf to keep it going. Yes, I'm sure. And how are you for warehousing? Um, we're very lucky that we have um, a good facility in Paisley provided at below commercial rates um, from the council. So it's we rent from the council. We have agreed a, a a deal with them some time ago that is favorable i mean it's we still do pay for it and it's it's not an insubstantial part of our overheads but it's cheaper than we'd get it if we were going out into the, the market commercially um we have essentially two units that that are joined together one of which we use as our main day-to-day -day warehouse and one that we store our organic stock because we have to do quite a lot of very specific processes for organic stock in terms of batch control but also some of our stock that's sort of extra so um a large amount of stock that isn't we're not going to be picking and packing from in the next week or two that sort of thing and then since we introduced the friends range in the autumn last year We've actually converted the bit between those two warehouses to a, a shelving area for Divine Chocolate, Cafe Direct, and then turned the radiators off in that bit. We don't have radiators in the main warehouse, but that bit in between did have radiators. But obviously, you don't want to store chocolate with too much heat. So that the, those radiators have now been turned off, which is saving us energy as well. Um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Susan, and, and for the response, Tracy. Are there any other questions at all? Um, Catherine, yeah. How did you manage through the um, lockdown period? Um, so sales wise, the first bit of lockdown was brilliant for us because we had rice when everybody was panic buying rice. Um, so we and we actually had rice arrive from the processors two weeks into that horrendous period where we were locked down and everybody wanted rice, toilet roll and pasta. We didn't have any toilet roll or pasta, but we did have rice and we sold rice like we've never sold rice before. Um, in terms of operationally, what we did was um, we converted to a one person in at a time process. We implemented quite strict loan working policies. So we made sure that people were checking in regularly. 
Um, we didn't have remote access to our main sales order system. So we needed both warehousing staff and sales staff to be able to get into the warehouse. We have since managed to get remote access to that. But um, so we had basically warehousing. We were only shipping two days a week and we had staff for warehousing in on those two days. And we had staff for more administrative tasks in the other three days. And I didn't come in for months because I didn't need access to any of those things. And we had regular team meetings every day, initially on WhatsApp, and then we got a Zoom license and moved to Zoom um, so that we were talking lots um, and liaising and trying to work out what to do. We were really pleased to be able to, we actually didn't just honor our orders for um, our producers, partners that year. We actually increased our orders for producer partners that year. We did have a lot of issues in the August of 2020 because we'd sold through a lot of stock and the new stock wasn't arriving because there were so many logistics challenges in the summer of 2020. So we actually were, we were basically saying, you can order from us if you want. And I think we had white rice and that was about all, you know, it was like, <laughs> you can't have any of the other 20 products that we do or 40 products that we do, you can have this. <laughs> um, and then thankfully things started arriving in the September and and, and we, we kept going. We did, we were very fortunate to receive some of the COVID related grants um, that helped us initially just in sort of coping. The third sector resilience grant in Scotland was available to us for the for the 2020 and then we had an adapt and thrive grant the following year which is one of the things that has helped us do the rebranding if we hadn't had that grant we wouldn't have had the funding to do the rebranding because we saw that we actually needed to get into a wider market than just the fair trader market and and that needed that that rebranding um and we have also accessed one of the bounce back loans which we're now a couple of years into paying back We used to sell a lot through churches and schools pre-COVID and that set of sales obviously completely disappeared. It's now coming back, but three years on. So that's been quite hard. And, and just a question for Sally, how are, how are things um, in Kenya at the moment with the climate situation and, and your, um, your situation at Meru Herbs? Um. At the moment, it's for us is an unpredict unpredictability because um, we used to certain seasons. We used to eat raining between this month and then we are harvesting this month. But then now that has really changed to the the climate change that has really changed. So even when you put a crop in the farm, you're not guaranteed. You you, you like I, like I mentioned, you just put the crop. And then you pray that everything goes well because the climate really is unpredictable. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to do a bit of water conservation and um, looking at farming methods that can actually be able to mitigate the current issues we're having right now. Uh, luckily for us, the hibiscus is very, I mean, the, the, some of the herbal teas are very resistant, but they, we struggle a lot with the chamomile because that one is very mm. susceptible to the weather conditions. But, and then uh, in 2019, we actually had a locust invasion, something that has not happened in a long time. So really we need to make decisions or find ways that we can really mitigate the current situation with the climate. I, th I think some of what you said has highlighted the importance of having a diversity of crops so that some things that are suitable in some conditions um, may may struggle in others, but if you yeah. if you have a mix, then that should help. So, hopefully, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We're really pleased that um, following the um, trade craft going into administration, we were approached by Transform Trade to understand the impact on our producer groups and Following that, some of you may be aware of the Transform Trade Producer Fund that they ran. Um, we had ident identified Meru as our most vulnerable producer group following the, the administration at, at Tradecraft because we sold a lot of their products to Tradecraft. Um, we are the only importer in the UK, but a lot of it went to Tradecraft. And in the last few weeks, you've received a grant through Transform Trade that will help um, Meru with machinery or like 
equipment, so things like scales, but also with training around fair trade principles and, and so on. And so, with some of the sort of certification around um, food safety and, and things, we know that we, if we're going to extend the market for these products into more mainstream markets, we will need increased certification for, for them. And there was also the solar panels, some of the re refurbishing of the solar panels to make sure that they continue to operate um, efficiently. So that's been a huge support to us through the last few months as we've been debating whether we can actually place an order this year because with because of the de reduced demand from um, obviously well the no demand from from tradecraft seeing what the impact of that is on on our sales we have now agreed more or less agreed this morning um, our order for this year and we will be trialing the herbal teas that Sally's been talking about they were briefly available through tradecraft about ten years ago. Um, and we have never imported them, but we're going to trial them because various people have said yes, they think it would be a good idea. So they won't come in in True Origin branding this year because it's a trial, but the other products from Meru will come in in True Origin branding in the autumn. Mm -hmm. Susan, have you got another question? I see your hand is, is yeah, up. Yeah, I was just going to um, a question for Sally and asking about the hibiscus production particularly. Um, I know of it as a flower, but I was just wondering how much any one person can grow, what sort of quantities and the time involvement in them, tending them, just to get some idea of just how intensive that is. Okay, so the business? Yeah. Um, every farmer has an option of dedicating a quarter of their a quarter acre of their land to organic farming and in that quarter they grow everything organic so hibiscus is the most popular because it's the easiest to grow i mean once yeah. you plant it uh, and you just need to do a bit of weeding and that's good to go chamomile on the other hand is very very labor intensive because mm. it requires a lot of intensive care it requires water to the water. right measurement and then when it comes to harvesting it's Hibiscus, like you saw in the slide, hibiscus is tall, so you, you can actually stand and, and harvest it. But the fukamo you almost have to kneel or squat, or mm -hmm. actually in Kenya, we make some little stools that you actually sit on, and because fukamo uh, is, is slightly lower, and it's um, because you really have to harvest. So our fukamo um, is different because it we only harvest the flower, we don't take the stalk. So it's if you taste it, it's very, it's very like um how do it? it's very rich because we don't do the stock, we just do the flower. Mm -hmm. But for hibiscus, it's much easier. It is our largest selling, it is our largest selling hub, and it creates the highest employment. We use hibiscus and for the and then for the um, the hibiscus gem is doing well. I think it has got the good taste it, award. I think it did yeah. have great taste award. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's um, I I'm not really a jam person. I love the hibiscus jam because it's more tangy, more more. It's slightly like a black currant jam it, rather than a raspberry jam. If 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 those are two sort of distinct. Um, one of the things we're doing this year for the first time as a trial is one of our gift packs. So we we quite often put products together in gift packs for Christmas. This year we're doing a hibiscus and mango, which I think we have done before from Meru, but we're actually giving people the option of a sort of a gift for life bit in there so that you can uh, buy, pay more and a hibiscus tree bush will be planted in, in Kenya as, as a result. So I think people will still have something to give. It's not like the sort of Oxfam gift for life where you maybe just get a card or a magnet or, or whatever, you will still have a, a, a duo pack of jam, but it will cost a lot more than a duo pack of jam um, because it will be planting a tree in in Kenya as well. Um, Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, fascinating to hear that, Tracy, about the uh, the little stools you mentioned that uh, that are used in the chamomile, uh, mm. the chamomile production as well, and, and indeed learn more about the, the hibiscus. Thank you. Um, just to to draw things to a close, then being being aware of of time. Thank you so much, Tracy and Sally. Um, it's been really excellent to hear more about both 
JTS's story um, and indeed Meru Herb's story. So thank you both so much for, for sharing that with us this afternoon. Um, and thank you to you all for joining for your questions. Um, if you do have any questions to Tracy or to Sally, um, as I say, do send them through to us at Shared Interest and we'll pass those on um, and try and get responses to share back with you. Um, and as I mentioned, Tracy, we can follow up and make sure that we get links to those videos that we can share with people as well. So we can, uh, we can follow up on that um, with everybody. Um, but yeah, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in the UK, Sally, and a mm -hmm. safe journey back whenever that may be. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.